Okay. Are we ready to start as our um, introduction music fades away? <laughs> that will be edited out because it's copyrighted. So I want to say welcome everyone um, to Office Hours with Dave and Anita. Believe it or not, this is episode number 14. And today we are focusing on fire damage in the vineyard, assessment, recuperation and fruiting in subsequent seasons. Definitely very, very relevant information. There's been a lot of seminars focusing on a grape smoke exposure, specifically impact on grape and wines, but definitely not enough information about, okay, what about the vine itself and what's next? And we know there's plenty of vineyards that were impacted by the fires in uh, the, this horrific season that has nothing to commend itself. Our two speakers today, is Professor Andy Walker and Dr. Khan Kutcherell, and I'm the lucky person to introduce them today. And hopefully I can run through both their CVs at the speed of light. So uh, Professor Andy Walker got his um, bachelor's degree in botany, master's degree in horticulture and viticulture, and PhD in genetics at UC Davis. I'm not gonna say when. And he then directly joined the department and has been working here for a few years. And he's been basically the cornerstone of most of the viticultural practices courses here at the department and um, is um, training his replacements in the future. And his research program has focused on developing new rootstocks with resistance to fan leaf, dagger, and root knot nematodes and phylloxera. Um, his lab studies the genetics of resistance to these pests, their genetic diversity and aggress aggressivity, and host pest interaction of these pests with grape species. I can't read this quickly. Dr. Walker's uh, lab is also actively involved in breeding table raised in wine grapes for resistance to pest disease and powdery mildew. And lab activities include classical breeding, inheritance studies, the development of rapid resistance essays, field trials of promising rootstocks, and science selections, DNA marker analysis, mapping, and genetic engineering, just in case you thought he was bored. And then in November of 2000, he was appointed the Louis Martini Endowed Chair in Viticulture. And a year now, a year ago, he released five new grape varieties, three red, two whites, and they are highly resistant to pierce disease. I think the first commercial um, wines of these were made. Um, they're Caminer, Nor, Pizia, Nor, and Erante, Nor, and I probably in Ambulo Blanc and Caminante Blanc, and Andy's gonna tell me I said that totally wrong. Um, so let's move on. Um, next up will be uh, Dr. Khan Kutrell. Um, he did his master's and his PhD at Illinois University in respectively plant and soil science and plant biology. Um, he first job was actually as an extension specialist at the University of Kentucky. After that, he moved to CSU Fresno, where he was a professor until he moved in 2015 to UC Davis as the associate specialist in viticulture. Um, Khan focuses on three main parts, his research improving production efficiency in vineyards by applying principles of canopy and crop load management using vineyard mechanization and applied water amounts, identifying quality improvement traits in berry composition by translating fundamental research into applied production practices in vineyards and evaluating alternative methods of controlling invasive species in vineyards. That went slightly better, my was heated up now. So thank you very much. Obviously we're in good hands for telling us what to do in the vineyard and I should know this, but who's going first? Uh, I'm on first. Andy. Okay, so first let's give it over to Andy Walker. Uh, and before, Andy, just before you, you start, I just wanna mention uh, many of you have probably been on these uh, office hours before, but if you have questions along the way, you have many ways to ask them. You can uh, open your participants panel and click on the raise hand. You can put your question into chat um, or just ask it when we get done to uh, with the talks. Um, we're happy to do any of those ways. Go ahead, okay. Andy. Good, thanks, Anita. That was a long-winded uh, expose of my career, I guess. I'm just <laughs> coming to a rapid end. <laughs> it's the every day. Um, so Khan and I talked about how to address this subject, and, and we thought maybe I'd present you with the botany of the 
of the cane and the mud, the parts that are being damaged by the fire. And he'd, he'd mop up with, uh, literally mop up with uh, how do we put out the fire and how hot does it get and what damages what and, and um, the important aspects, which, which are a little bit intangible as well as you'll, as you'll see. Let me share my screen here. Uh, where did my talk go? There we go. Okay, can you see that okay? Yep, we are good. Okay, good. Let me just move this thing out of the way a little bit. And okay, so um, a bit about grape anatomy. It, it turns out that grapes have a, a unknown but very useful function in California, and that's that they're, they're actually a fire retardant. They don't burn very well. Uh, and in fact, it probably at some point insurance adjusters will come to your house and say, if you put vineyards around your place, you're, they'll be less, less liable to damage. And yeah, that may actually be a way of repopulating some of these wooded areas that we probably shouldn't be in overall in the end. Um, so let's talk about that shoot. During the growing season, that shoot is, is a cork green and it has leaves. And at the, at the base of each of those leaves where the petiole comes into the stem, there are two buds. There's a dormant bud that develops over the season and there's a lateral bud that grows during that season. And that lateral bud either grows that year or drops off. And it can turn into a new shoot with more dormant buds on it. So it gets a little bit tricky sometimes to think about uh, the origin of a lot of these organs as, as you're looking at them. Uh, the dormant bud is the key thing. So it develops over that season. And it, and it turns out to be a compound bud. It has three buds within it. Uh, and each of those buds is a compressed shoot of anywhere between six and eight or nine nodes. And those nodes are the, where the petiole begins developing and the leaf begins developing. So that, that's all going on during the season. Next year's leaves and, and, uh, and, and the organs are, are, going, are being produced and, and developing during that season. So we have one primary bud, that's the main axis. And we have two secondary buds that come off of that main axis that develop off that side. Okay, And there are bud scales that wrap around that and lots of tomentum that protect, protect those buds. Uh, and that, that really the main reason those canes don't uh, burn very well is because they're full of water most of the time. It takes a lot to dry them down entirely. Uh, there's, they're, they're quite buoyant <laughs> that way, or maybe not uh, non-buoyant, they sink well through, with lots of water. Towards the end of the season, they get more and more dry as, as the season finishes up and through the winter season, they're, they're, they're dried out entirely. Okay. So we have a lot of positions. There's three shoots with six to eight compressed nodes in each of those shoots. So there's, there's anywhere between 18 and 20 plus, maybe 30 initial points at which they can grow from. And they stay there. So after we finish pruning, uh, we usually say we cut back to one bud. But if you look at things very, very closely, we cut back to three or four buds sometimes. Those buds may not be distinguishable in some ways, but they're there. And they have the initials of, of the organ, uh, initial organs that can, can form this material. That's where these things come back from. So when you hit it, hit a vine with a tractor and it's full and mature, full size and mature, uh, it, it grows out from buds that are, that are buried underneath the bark. Uh, and that were the originally those same nodes that trace back all the way to those buds if you want to. So there's a lot of positions from which they can grow quite readily. And it's, it's quite difficult to, to, to kill a vine sometimes. They keep popping back, back again. Um, let's see here. Can I move that slide along? There we go, there we go. Uh, so internally, that's all that xylem is all that water conducting tissue in the center here. There's pith in the middle, that, that more compressed area. But these rays that come out to the sides, they're not technically rays, but those, those, uh, those uh, panels of, of xylem are full of water during the season. And that's, that's, that's what we're really concerned with and where it's, where it's uh, pumping through from. On the outside of that, outside of the, uh, the xylem tissue is a thin layer of phloem that, which conducts uh, photosynthate through the vine. Uh, and conducts water occasionally here and there as well. It's a more complicated issue. And then there's a, there another a cambium that, that forms both those tissues. So that's a, a new regenerative tissue area that forms xylem to the inside and phloem to the outside. And there's a periderm on the outside that, that produces bark, which also helps make those canes relatively resilient, but nothing like the, like the amount of water that's in the center that's really dampening their ability to burn. So in this time of year now, we can see these things, we can look at them. Uh, as you look at that node, there's a, 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 at each of these nodes, there's the inner node between them and the node at the, at the point of, um, um, at, at the point where the leaf was last year. And at the, at the leaf has dropped off at this point and that, and that uh, latent bud is still present, okay? And if you look closely 
you'll you'll see these parts. Okay, you'll you'll also see opposite this one on the top is a little stub, and that's really the the rachis from last year that was chopped back. So those parts are all present, and they they could burn if they wanted to as well. So if, as you look at that one dormant bud. And if you dissected it, and Khan's been dissecting buds recently, he's become an ardent foe of dissecting buds probably by now. Not, that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, if you cut that bud carefully this time of year, you can see the three buds. And if you pick it apart, you can judge how effective that node's going to be in terms of producing fruit the following year. You can count the number of clusters and you can make some estimation. It's actually not very easy, but some people spend a lot of time um, uh, sort of analyzing what might be there coming up for the next year. And what could influence it? Well, last year's crop levels may have been too high, in which case next year's crop levels are gonna be lower because there's a competition between the initiation of these buds and, and the development of, of last year's fruit as well. So when we look at these things, how, how do we assess damage? Well, we're gonna look at those canes. We're gonna look at the cambium, which is normally sort of a creamy color with a bit of green through it uh, if it's healthy. As, as the season goes on, it becomes more and more towards court creamy and less and less towards green. Um, when it's damaged, they, they're more tan or browned and, and, and uh, they could be dry as well. So as you look at that, that cambium zone, that circular uh, tissue that generates this, the xylem and the phloem, uh, it, it'll be clearly hurt and, and, and affected and browned in those cases. Uh, the graph union is where the, the plants come together and then most, more often than not, the plants come back from below the graph union, which is going to help very much uh, because the, you'll have to regraft those plants and it's not possible to really effectively regraft them. So it's, it's good to see where that regrowth is occurring. And there's often a flurry of growth that occurs at the, that union between the cyan and, and the rootstock. And all that tissue came from the one bud that was left there when they grafted that initially, because there is no tissue below that. They, they, they graft below that, that node on the rootstock. So there's a tremendous capacity to grow in these things. And there's, there's a lot of these initials that form. And I'm sure most of you have seen the flurry of rootstocks that push occasionally or rootstock shoots that push uh, just, just at, below that graft union that occurs or just above that graft union. So how do we remediate? That's the big question. What do we do? How do we replace things? Khan's going to get it out here in a bit, but uh, how do you judge to replant uh, or not is, is a big question and, and, and it's a difficult one to approach sometimes. Uh, how do you prune these things this year? Well, you should probably leave more buds because you're not really sure as to how badly all those buds were affected. And some of that, that sort of prediction about how things are going to go can be made by based on how hot that fire was. And uh, that, that has a, a lot to do with how all these vines will respond and how, when they'll come back. Oftentimes, it'll just be a few boundary vines that'll be affected on the edge of where a vineyard was and where the forest or the chaparral occurs from, from that. And um, uh, if it's very hot and those vines really, really are, have been, or not the vines, but the, the shrubbery has been... Uh, uh, dried out substantially, it can get very, very hot and, and burn through those those areas too. And if that happens, then we're going to see more more death and, and more uh, uh, failure as it moves towards the side of the vineyard. Okay, so we we've got to look at those materials. We've got to cut through those canes. We've got to look to see how healthy they are. And they often they they look pretty good. And and if if a fire occurs early in the season, those vines invariably will start growing before you start pulling them out. Uh, so it's a it's an interesting phenomenon as we go through. Okay. So that covers most of the, the background stuff that you need to know about. How do you then go through and start repairing these things? Con, take it away. You're muted, I think. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, <clears throat> all right, let me share my screen. Do, 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 do. OK. So, so um, well, the uh, initial question uh, we get is, uh, why are things burning? Uh, things are burning because uh, it's getting warmer and there's lots of uh, fuel uh, and uh, things are uh, projected to uh, get warmer. And um, the uh, most recent prediction is that uh, we're going to see a 77% increase of the uh, surface burnt annually by the end of this uh, century. So I pulled up these uh, figures from the uh, Scripps uh, Institute. Um, uh, we are seeing uh, a lot of our uh, regions uh, increase in our temperature uh, where a lot of our uh, scrub and our uh, forests are. Uh, they're uh, about uh, seven degrees uh, warmer than uh, they used to be. 
And uh, when we look at the uh, emission scenarios, there are um, a low emission scenario, high emission scenario, and our historic uh, measurements, we are going to see uh, more emissions, uh, meaning carbon emissions into the atmosphere. That's going to increase these uh, temperatures uh, even further. And this is the uh, projection for uh, Senalina, about uh, four miles uh, north of uh, Oakville uh, Station. So uh, things are not looking good uh, if we do not change our uh, habits. Uh, we have a lot of these uh, fires, uh, maquis or uh, chaparrales. Uh, we have a dry climate with very high uh, flammability. Uh, I mean, naturally, uh, these are susceptible to uh, periodic fires. However, uh, the periodicity of uh, these fires have uh, decreased. We used to see them about uh, 30 uh, every 30 years or so. Now they're burning uh, every year. And this was uh, attributed to the uh, change in climate. These are also uh, referred to as uh, crown fires. They do burn uh, very hot and uh, they do have a very rapid uh, spread because uh, uh, they are combined with uh, dry grass uh, fuels and also the uh, shrubs, which have a lot of uh, oils and uh, volatiles uh, in their uh, tissue. There are lots of uh, models of uh, how these uh, spread. Uh, you can uh, grab these uh, models from the uh, Forestry uh, Service. Uh, I will make this uh, presentation available. Uh, with a high uh, fuel load under uh, dry climate uh, shrub situations, the uh, fires uh, spread uh, very rapidly and uh, they burn uh, extremely hot. And the uh, flame lengths uh, can uh, increase uh, above uh, 20 uh, feet. And this is uh, what we have uh, seen uh, within the last uh, two fires in uh, California. So combined with the Mediterranean climate, and uh, we also have a, a hyper arid uh, cropping season uh, last year. For example, in uh, Oakville, uh, we only had about uh, 235 millimeters of uh, precipitation in the whole uh, water year. That's uh, October to uh, October. So these things uh, contributed uh, to uh, these things uh, a lot. So a lot of the uh, USDA models uh, indicates uh, that crops should survive. Uh, like Andy said, uh, crops do survive. However, uh, they might not survive to be economically uh, viable. What we more often than, uh, 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 what we mostly uh, lose is the uh, irrigation uh, infrastructure uh, in these uh, situations. We have seen a lot of the uh, drip hoses, filters, and our uh, risers, uh, risers uh, being damaged. And uh, they will be uh, damaged further if the uh, fire encroaches uh, via dry grass uh, in the uh, alleyways into the uh, vineyard. Uh, we have seen uh, equipment being damaged that were uh, left in our uh, sheds or barns or uh, out in the open. And then our uh, row and our uh, border vines uh, have also been uh, damaged if they were uh, planted with uh, uh, wooden uh, stakes. The grapevine damage, like uh, Andy uh, mentioned, uh, here's my uh, attempt at uh, drawing a grapevine. Uh, the damage uh, is happening from the uh, ground up. The progression is uh, first the uh, slowing off uh, bark uh, burns as the uh, grass uh, encroaches into the uh, vineyard. Uh, through the trunk, it might uh, reach into the canopy, to the cordon, to the shoot. Uh, as uh, Andy said, the uh, phalogen can uh, you know, usually uh, protect the shoot or the uh, buds uh, that are uh, on it. However, uh, if the fire gets uh, hot enough, uh, the uh, area that will be, uh, you know, uh, the grapevine will be sprouting from will be around the uh, graft uh, union. So the grapevine has a latent bud, like Andy mentioned. We do not have our uh, fruiting buds or our uh, shoot buds, unlike uh, in other uh, uh, crops. We do have uh, a compound bud. The most up. Uh, um, Fruitful bud is the uh, uh, primary bud. You have the uh, secondary and the tertiary buds that are not as fruitful. Uh, you can assess this damage by uh, slicing the buds. There is no uh, halfway death. Uh, you know, uh, once the uh, primary uh, uh, bud is damaged, uh, you will more than likely uh, get uh, quite a bit of damage. So uh, you will have uh, oxidative uh, damage uh, in these cases. Uh, so here's a healthy primary bud. Here's a dead secondary bud, but a healthy tertiary bud. Uh, in the uh, bottom picture, you have a dead main bud, dead tertiary bud, but a healthy uh, secondary bud. So we have been uh, cutting through these uh, throughout our uh, Calistoga area. We are seeing these uh, uh, being damaged from the uh, ground up. Uh, this is the uh, graft union uh, area, one of those uh, buried uh, buds that uh, uh, 
that Andy had uh, talked about. In this case, uh, the uh, primary bud was uh, quite healthy. The uh, secondary bud was uh, damaged. As we uh, moved up the trunk uh, in this case, one of the other uh, buried buds, the uh, uh, primary bud was uh, uh, damaged by the uh, fire, probably because the uh, uh, bark uh, slowed off uh, very quickly. But uh, as we uh, reached onto the uh, canopy, uh, the latent buds were uh, still uh, quite healthy uh, in this case. So the uh, extent of the damage uh, is still not going to be known until the uh, next season when we have a uh, bud break. In the case that uh, uh, you want to uh, review these things, uh, the probably the uh, uh, dormancy period is the uh, best time to uh, look at these buds. Uh, we still have not had a you know a killing frost in a majority of the areas, so probably uh, January is the uh, ideal time to start uh, looking at these buds. Their uh, uh, vitality. Uh, the reproductive cycle, and on the other hand, is a two-year process. Uh, of course, uh, we're going to have a uh, cluster initiation, uh, differentiation, uh, pollination and fertilization, berry set, berry softening and a uh, harvest. So we might not see the uh, full results of these fires for another year, even after uh, this year. Uh, a lot of the uh, questions is, uh, I don't have fire, but uh, fruit was left on the vine. Uh, what do I do? It's okay to leave the uh, fruit on the vine. It will not affect carbohydrate storage as long as the uh, leaf area was uh, maintained uh, properly prior to uh, killing frost, uh, because that's what uh, maintains the uh, uh, carbohydrate in the uh, perennial parts of the uh, grapevine. Uh, you can calculate the cost of uh, grapevine replacements. Uh, this website is uh, available. Uh, you can uh, put in how many vines uh, you're losing, its age, its replacement cost, so on and so forth. It'll give you a value if you're uh, going to make uh, claims on this stuff. Also, uh, cost of uh, establishment in case of total loss is also available. Uh, farm advisors and myself uh, updated a lot of these uh, from 2019 from San Joaquin Valley to uh, Napa County. All can be found on the uh, cost studies uh, website. So with that, uh, I will quit talking and stop sharing. Okay. Uh, we, we have people already putting questions in the chat. So again, you can uh, put your question right in the chat and Anita and I will read them to uh, our speakers or you can raise your hand with by pressing the little blue raise hand button on participants panel and we can have you ask the question that way. So let me, let me start by asking the uh, some of the questions that are in the chat. Um, with uh, people using a no-till approach and leave short dry grass everywhere, will this ignite the bark, especially on old vines? Um, I'll take an attempt at uh, answering. Uh, it depends on the uh, nature of the fire and uh, how fast uh, it's spreading, but uh, uh, if you're a uh, you know, frequent driver of uh, Highway 128, <laughs> between uh, Napa County and uh, Yolo County, uh, you can see this in uh, action. A lot of our uh, vineyards are uh, now uh, no-till and uh, that's how uh, it has uh, spread in a lot of these uh, regions. However, uh, uh, it will only go in about like uh, 20 to uh, 25 uh, plants uh, in, after which uh, it loses uh, its uh, strength. So, but uh, yes, uh, it does spread the uh, uh, fire uh, quite rapidly if it's burning hot like a typical crown fire. All right, uh, I'll ask another question. I'll turn it over to Anita. Um, there's a question in the chat. Do I understand correctly that you can determine the extent of fire damage in a vineyard by dissecting a sampling of the existing buds? Well, I think the answer is no. You can dissect those buds but I think the correlation between damage and, and what you're going to see there is, is quite difficult to make. And a lot of it has to do with the way those buds are placed and the way they sprout. Of course, they're gonna to have to be retrained differently if they sprout from normal positions that are spur related or arm related or whether they're from lower, lower down the line. So those things all have an impact. And typically those buds that are protected under the bark probably are more durable than the knot uh, in terms of heat, heat effects. So uh, the vine itself is, 
the structure of the vine may be damaged, but the vine itself will still be alive. And that's the, the key issue is how you retrain, how you redevelop those things and whether you can spend the money to do that. Okay, I have a question for either one of you or both of you. Um, is this damage seen, I su suppose that means a fire damage, seen when the ground immediately under the vine burned? Or is this also from what appears to be radiant heat damage? Uh, probably both, I would say. And it depends on the age of the vine again and how many of those buds are, are young and very active shoots versus older and, and protected underneath the, underneath the bark and how much you want to, how much time and effort you want to spend redeveloping those vines from those more difficult positions too, I think. So it, 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 it depends. And the heating that, you know, that you, you really don't want forest right up to the edge of your vineyard <laughs> because the, the roots of nothing else outcompete those poor vines and they don't do very well. But if you do have that, that's where you're going to see quite a bit of damage, of course, and that radiant heat uh, will have an impact with those cases. Okay, thank you. This is a question. Did I hear? Uh, did I hear Andy say it won't be practical to regraft fire damaged vines? Um, I would say probably as a as a general statement, that's true. <laughs> and, and again, it's because you're you're going to have to find you're going to get a lot of suckers that sprout from below the ground, and you're going to be fighting those rootstock suckers forever if you regraft them. Um, it, it probably makes much more sense to replace it if it's the first year or second year of growth. Um, and they did a good, very good job at disbudding your rootstocks. Maybe it wouldn't have a, as big an impact, and you you could reconsider that. So here's another question: Why don't vines which are fire girdled bounce back as well as table grape vines which are girdled intentionally? <laughs> um, part of that is the nature of that girdle, right? One <laughs> is a thin, very thin band. Yeah, it's two uh, millimeters. That, that heals over quickly. Yeah, two three millimeters as opposed to the entire trunk or big portions of that trunk that are burned off, so. Yeah, um, so, oh, sorry, Dave. Um, no, sure. So um, I've seen other ways to evaluate potential damage or to see if a vine is still viable is to sort of take like a nick into the trunk to see like you've described that you actually have that cream green color showing that your phloem and everything else is still healthy um, and then if it's like brown color, they say, okay, your trunk is basically dead. That's true. Again, the yeah. question is how many cuts and how, where do you have to look and what percentage of the, the circumference is impacted? All those things have a lot to do with how well it comes back, of course, too. So, I mean, it's hard to kill a grapevine, but it's going to damage it a lot. Mm. <laughs> Let's put it that way, I guess, in terms of redevelopment and retraining. I mean, that's basically uh, what it comes down to, uh, what portion of that uh, circumference is uh, damaged and the uh, length of the uh, uh, damage uh, along that uh, uh, slipping bark, uh, for lack of a better term. So. so basically, you would rather recommend waiting a little bit because as soon as they start budding, you're going to get an idea if that vine is viable or not, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, sometimes... Uh, they will bud out and then uh, grow, but uh, all of a sudden, uh, July, once we start seeing the uh, you know water deficits uh, take effect, they might just uh, collapse. Okay. So I mean, uh, it's somewhat uh, similar to uh, this like uh, winter damage uh, we used to see, but uh, you know it's all in like uh, you know damage to the uh, uh, conductive uh, tissue to the uh, vasculature of the uh, grapevine uh, in the end. Okay. So and in, in general, you don't want to have that vine out compete itself for recovery either. So you would drop crop, you make sure you really benefit the vegetative growth of the vine, not something else. And you'll cut back positions. And it, it's, it takes a lot of effort to retrain them properly. And, and that's the big issue, whether you're willing to spend that money and time or start again. Okay, there's a, another question in chat. Do you have an idea on how on heat intensity and duration, uh, the effect of heat intensity and duration on damage to different organs on vines? The short answer, an easy one is no. <laughs> um, and I don't think there's very much written on that. And again, it would depend, I'm sure, on varieties and place and how hot that it's hot. And it's um, probably difficult to actually take that data. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, on that uh, forestry service uh, publication, uh, they do have some uh, idea on like uh, trees, but uh, for crops, uh, they're saying like it just survives. So they haven't uh, looked at crops. So their uh, criteria is that like uh, if it's uh, irrigated, it's going to survive. But, you know, uh, that remains to be seen. Um, another question in chat, do you feel butt dissections will be less viable this year? Because the fires were so late or? I think they're probably about as accurate all the time. <laughs> very difficult to do well. <laughs> That's they're the best answer. Well. <laughs> so uh, something I want to ask. So my understanding is that we've talked about fire damage, but there's also uh, a lot of concern about grapes being, or vines being exposed to very smoky conditions for weeks and end, and whether that would have a long-term effect on vines, especially if this is like a recurring occurrence. You know, there's not a lot of research on this. I know about one study that showed that the, the vine did actually bounce back or recover pretty quickly, but that was exposed to smoke not to excessive amount of time and not a recurring amount of smoke just a one-time exposure any thoughts on that yeah, we tracked it uh this year at uh, oakville uh starting with the uh, initial fire uh which coincided with our harvest so uh what happens uh during these uh fires is that uh, uh crop evapotranspiration uh, essentially stops because the uh, it's driven by a uh radiation, 80% of the uh, model is radiation. When there is no radiation, uh, there is no uh, transpiration, so the uh, stomata are closed. So when we came back about a week later, when the uh, smoke dissipated, the plants were uh, operating uh, properly. But within the uh, meantime, the plants had like what I would call a paradoxical uh, water status. Although the uh, stomata were uh, closed, they still had a very low uh, 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 leaf water uh, potential or a stem water potential. So the duration of this uh, will probably uh, affect it, but I uh, you know grapevines are like weeds. So uh, they will, uh, they bounce back uh, quite readily once, uh, you know, uh, the uh, photosynthetic uh, machinery is, uh, you know, replaced or uh, repaired. Okay. That's what, that's what we have seen uh, this year. Well, what that's one piece of good news. And what, what about, I know in, in Napa, including at our vineyards, we had uh, quite a bit of ash sitting on the vines and fruit and so forth for probably a month or so prior to harvest. And, you know, obviously up until the first rains or so, maybe after that. I was wondering, is there, do you know, is there any positive, negative or positive effects on the vine uh, from uh, long-term ash contact? Uh, so uh, we did the uh, light curves uh, for those uh, plants uh, during the uh, fires. We uh, dosed them with like, a, you know, zero parts per million uh, light all the way up to uh, 2,500 parts per million of light. So the ones uh, with ash, they're always, uh, you know, uh, underperforming. The minute uh, we remove the uh, ash, uh, the uh, curve uh, saturates uh, very readily. I should have uh, shown those uh, figures. Uh, if I had known I was going to get this uh, question. So yes, it does uh, limit the uh, photosynthetic uh, efficiency of these uh, by about uh, one half as long as the ash uh, stays on. But given our, uh, given our conditions in California, when sunlight is not uh, at a deficit at any time uh, during the uh, year, uh, it's like putting them under a uh, shade cloth, uh, really. Uh, overall uh, carbohydrate balance uh, was probably not uh, affected as much, but I'm not willing to uh, dig up any more plants by a back row uh, this year, I'm done. <laughs> um, there's another question um, in chat. Is there any rationale behind why we saw brick number, bricks numbers dropping once the smoke came in? Uh, they saw bricks numbers dropping from 21 down to 19, 18 bricks. Uh, grapevine has the uh, ability to, uh, uh, once they're uh, carbon starved, like I mentioned earlier, once they're carbon starved, uh, they can uh, call uh, sugar and uh, starch from uh, different uh, organs. 
So more than likely, uh, if you saw a uh, bricks drop uh, by like uh, two, three bricks, uh, which is quite a lot, uh, those vines were probably uh, in a, a severe water deficit to begin with. So they were probably calling for uh, uh, carbohydrates from our organs where they need it. That's the only explanation I can come up with. Andy has seen uh, more stuff than me. So uh, you might have a better idea. They do compensate. And I think you could probably do those experiments too if you want to do it with shade, various shade cloths and things. You yeah. really starve parts of the vine and watch carbohydrates move in, in different areas. Yeah. I mean, 70% uh, uh, of the uh, carbohydrates are in the uh, roots of the uh, vine. Uh, the trunk is more than, uh, is acting more like a conduit. And the uh, majority of the uh, uh, production is uh, in the leaves. So uh, it can uh, move it uh, very rapidly when uh, it can uh, sense a stress, which was, uh, you know, severe stress in this case, because uh, they're not programmed to, uh, uh, you know, drop leaves uh, this early, but, uh, you know, once there was uh, no light and uh, photosynthetic machinery was, uh, you know, uh, impeded, they were uh, able to uh, move things around. So it's probably not a good idea to wait uh, longer than uh, 25 bricks to uh, harvest grapes anymore. Um, it seems like Dave is busy. Oh, no, Dave. Uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm paying attention. Um, I'm getting a, 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 some direction from our director, too. So um, <laughs> I, I want to talk a little bit about irrigation. Um, so obviously, we've been focusing on the vine, but uh, we have the other parts of the vineyard that we have to worry about, too. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, damage to irrigation hoses heat damage to irrigation hoses um, and how do you go about assessing that and what parts of the system do you, should you be thinking about replacing? It, it depends on the heat again, of course, but, but the whole thing could be damaged entirely and the vines could be fine. So that's the, I mean, the infrastructure is what you're really concerned about in these fires. It's not so much the vines, it's, it's the posts, it's the, the wires, it's the drip irrigation system, it's the, it's the irrigation manifolds. <laughs> those, yeah. are, those are finished. And to turn the sprinklers on, it's the easiest way to detect it if you like, <laughs> because they'll be leaking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Andy's uh, spot on uh, in that respect. I mean, like uh, visibly, uh, the first thing that you see is the uh, drip hoses. And then, uh, you know, they have to be, uh, you know, removed and I uh, go to a class one uh, dump site. But uh, some of the uh, sites uh, vi we visited uh, this year, uh, uh, the uh, uh, manifolds uh, have like, uh, you know, burnt, like actual like PVC uh, manifolds have a uh, burnt. Uh, and uh, we don't know uh, what the uh, situation was uh, underground uh, with the laterals that were coming from the uh, pipe. So. Sometimes, uh, you know, they're traveling uh, 960 feet to a header. So, I mean, it's difficult to uh, assess this damage until you turn it on, like uh, Andy said. But, you know, it remains to be seen. So, but, yeah. So, so there's a, sorry, there's an interesting question in chat. Um, can, I, can I just do a quick follow-up? Sorry. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, sorry. So, so for both, let's say inline drippers or external drippers or thing or um, any other kind of spray device in the vineyard, do, you, you mentioned leaking when you turn it on, but do you also expect, is it possible that uh, some of the flow rates in those emitters can actually change due to heat damage? And is that something that people should be worried about? Well, the emitters will pop out to start with, I think, because that hose is going to expand and, and, and enlarge to some extent. So. So there's an issue there. Uh, I think normally it's horrifying when you look to see at the infrastructure, more so than the, the plants themselves. The effect is, is always pretty severe on that. If it's all the way in the middle of the vineyard, not so perhaps, but if it's an, on, a, on the periphery, that's a big issue. I mean, keep in mind that the uh, irrigation hose uh, will usually have water in it. But I mean, uh, for it to uh, like uh, reach in there, so uh, like in the uh, figure I showed uh, in the model, uh, the flames can uh, shoot up to, uh, 20 feet uh, into the uh, vineyard. Uh, I mean, it has to, and since these crown fires uh, burn uh, so hot, like it'll uh, boil the water, then uh, burn the uh, hose. So in that case, uh, distribution uniformity uh, will be uh, all messed up if you're just uh, going to, uh, you know, replace the uh, section of the hose. So that will need to be uh, assessed by, uh, you know, third party. 
Thank you. Um, so back to my question. Um, so I've heard, this is from Chad, I have heard that some vines in seasons after fire damage appear to have recovered and even produced fruit, but the wine quality is not the same. pH and color are off. Could you please speak to this? Well, the vines, it's gonna take a number of years for the vine to get balanced again and to grow properly. So that has a lot, has a lot to do with it. It's going to have a tendency to be overly vegetative and really push a lot of new shoots and, and more than, than uh, you'd expect. So that whole concept of regulating the amount of shoot growth so you, to, to the appropriate amount of fruit is, is, is uh, thrown into question again. And uh, you're, you're probably gonna have to work on fixing it on each individual case, an individual vine case oftentimes, readjusting the number of arms and positions on them and all those sort of things that would be important. And it would have a down the line of a consequential impact on fruit quality. So, so Andy, then what's what's the balance between just ripping the plant out and replanting versus trying to nurse a, a vine back to health? Is which which one is going to be a better idea? It depends on the percentage of what's gone, right? And what's what's impacted entirely. But but those vines that are toasted badly are not going to be a benefit to the vineyard. They're going to come, have to come out more than likely. And the infrastructure is difficult to take out without damaging those other vines you're trying to keep. So that it goes sort of snowballs on itself over time. Okay. Um, Khan, you, you mentioned um, in your presentation that it's okay to leave the, the fruit on the vine if you didn't harvest it. But I have a question regarding disease pressure, because if you have fruit hanging on the vine, um, you know, potentially rotting on there, um, isn't that an issue to be aware of? Uh, there's always that uh, concern. Uh, however, uh, we had, I feel like uh, we had this meeting uh, this week uh, as well with uh, uh, Kendra. So botrytis uh, is always in the uh, vineyard. It's not, uh, you know, you're not gonna change that. The main concern is, uh, you know, uh, if the uh, fruit is still on there and are uh, you removing or uh, you're coppicing our uh, vines to, uh, you know, replace trunks, uh, et cetera, that's when the uh, issue uh, becomes a problem. But uh, in an uh, otherwise uh, healthy uh, vineyard that just got, uh, you know, smoked out, uh, fruit was not picked, but and the uh, leaves were uh, healthy, uh, there's no uh, uh, impediments for uh, leaving the uh, fruit on the vine because uh, uh, birds will uh, get uh, most of it and the uh, rest of it uh, is removed by the uh, uh, mechanical pruner or the uh, you know, pruners as they uh, go by. Yep. Okay. I think Sounds birds are a, a big benefit there and they, they really come through and clean them out. If we could redirect all their feeding activity to, to December, we'd be in good, good, good shape. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I want to go back to kind of replanting costs and, and vineyard establishment costs. So um, I, I wonder if you can talk about kind of expected replanting costs and, and again, kind of balancing between replanting partial parts of vineyard blocks, maybe at the edges where there's fire damage versus uh, taking the opportunity to replace whole blocks, maybe with newer plantings or uh, newer trellis systems or things like that. I was wondering if you can talk about the balance there. Uh, a good rule of thumb is uh, about if the uh, if you're seeing uh, more than thirty percent damage, that it'll cost you more to uh, fix that vineyard than to uh, replant it. Again, uh, it depends on uh, which region uh, you are in. Um, uh, I'm, I'm working on the uh, North Coast now. Our, our replanting costs are uh, approaching uh, $35,000 an uh, acre. And most people uh, do not just plant uh, one acre. Our uh, mean vineyard size on the uh, North Coast is uh, 12 acres now. But, uh, you know, if this situation were to exacerbate and, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, moving down south to, uh, you know, uh, foothills, uh, Lodi uh, Fresno area where mean vineyard sizes are, you know, in excess of uh, 260 acres. Well, of course, the uh, economies of scale uh, will uh, change uh, drastically. Um, but replanting costs are, you know, uh, quite difficult to uh, deal with. So right now, uh, you know, uh, a 12 year old uh, vine is worth about, uh, you know, 
57 to a $60 uh, each just to uh, replace it. So that should, that's, uh, you know, baseline cost uh, you should be uh, looking at. So is there a tipping point based on vine or vineyard age? Um, well, I'm not the best. Uh, my wife does our uh, family budget, so I'm not the best with uh, numbers. But uh, but like I said, uh, you know, if you're uh, seeing more than 30% uh, damage in the uh, north coast, that vineyard uh, will have to be uh, replaced more than likely. So that should be the uh, tipping point. So another comment here in the, in the chat. So if the trunk of the vines have been damaged to soil level, it's a good, oh, it's just a comment. If the trunk of the vines have been damaged to soil, it's a good indicator to replace the vines. Would oh. you agree with that comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And again, it depends on the extent of the damage. You, you And you can retrain these vines. It's surprising how well they grow back from, from the trunk. But as Kam was saying, the expense is, is uh, compounded over years as you re redevelop those vines and reposition them. And perhaps the fruit quality is going to be impacted, of course, for the first, first years while you're getting it back into shape, if you can get it back into shape. So there's a, a question, I think, somewhat related to that in the chat. Uh, I think I'm still uncertain how to evaluate whether a vine should ultimately be removed if it's had partial damage. How much green growth in the spring would be enough to keep the vine? <laughs> well, it's, you know, you can grow the whole plant back from one little sprig at the base if you wanted to. So it's just a matter of time and effort and, and, and uh, labor that goes into that. Uh, yeah. I, if you start losing the arms and, and major parts of the cordons, uh, it takes a lot more time to, to retrain them and redevelop them. You know, best uh, strategy is to uh, wait till July to uh, make that uh, assessment because they might just be uh, growing fine. But, uh, you know, once that, uh, you know, uh, uh, evapotranspiration demand uh, hits, they might uh, just uh, collapse due to a lack of uh, vascular uh, tissue uh, that's active to feed that, uh, you know, uh, growth. Yeah, that's, that's uh, why it's so important to have some estimate of how well these vines or how badly the vines have been affected. But it's not easy to get that estimate. <laughs> so many things really are, are, are acting at the same time. Do you, would you say that waiting through the first year after the fire damage, complete one year cycle to assess what's going on is, is worthwhile? Or should you be making a decision, you know, let's say, by, by, I think, kind of you said June of June and July. Fire. Yeah, vines that haven't been bad, badly damaged. And in those cases, the irrigation could be gone and the stakes could be gone. And the vines themselves may actually be in pretty good shape. And they're going to butt out right away on the, off, off of the arm positions and the, maybe even some of the spurs that were, were left will, will still be active. Um, it depends. Uh, that's the that's the difficult part of, of judging this and, and accommodating it. Yeah, because I mean the the negative is I think probably if you wait a season that is going to give you a much better indicator of whether that vine needs to be replaced. The negative is that you've lost a year, basically. Uh, I know. I wonder what you think about this. So I know when the fires went through um, the Adelaide Hills in Australia. You know, some vineyards actually almost completely burnt. It was really just due to the force of the fire. Um, and they went in and evaluated each vine, just like a couple of months after the event, which surprised me. And, um, and I don't know exactly how they evaluated it, but I thought, I mean, I suppose basically what they did is what were clear indicators, like if the whole trunk is burned down to the ground, you're pretty clear, clear that it's going to be damaged and you need to remove it. I assume that's what they did. I, I don't, like you mentioned, cutting, you know, big chunks out of the trunk to evaluate the inside of the vine is going to also damage the vine. Well, they, they have the big advantage in Australia of not being on rootstock all the time. <laughs> so if the vines are on their own roots, it's just like being in Washington State, you can die right to the ground and they come right back again. They're, they're remarkably hardy in that sense. It's just a wasted year or two as you redevelop them. Okay, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's a good point. 
Yeah. Any other questions? Comments what? from our speakers, something that we missed? No. Well, I think, um, oh, we have another question just came in. How does fire affect the total nutrient pool in the soil as well as soil microbes? What about physical properties of the soil such as water holding capacity? I don't know. There's so many different facets to <laughs> take a look at, none of which. We, so, so it could be microbial. It can, it, I, physical properties of the soil, I think, would be less so, unless you had a lot of char and a lot, a lot of very strong cover. But the, new, new, the chemical aspects are going to have some impact. There's going to be a lot more carbon and associated problems with that carbon, I guess. So it's going to go along. And uh, the uh, microbiome uh, changes uh, during these uh, fire events, especially during these uh, crown fires that has been uh, documented, but uh, it has not been uh, studied in uh, vineyard uh, situations. Um, but, uh, you know, like uh, Andy said, uh, the addition of uh, excess carbon and probably uh, addition of uh, excess uh, potassium through these uh, fires uh, will certainly, uh, you know, uh, have some effect, but how measurable it is remains to be uh, seen because uh, it's a new era of uh, dealing with this kind of stuff. We were not ready to, uh, you know, uh, study these in reality. The other extreme has been documented or at least observed many times when you take a brush pile, a huge brush pile and set it off and, and, and it relates to soil problems for, for years occasionally and odd, odd situations, weird weird um, nutrient uptake and, and balance situation. Yeah, that's, so, why, that's why uh, they uh, push the uh, old vines uh, into the uh, alleyways uh, to burn them instead of uh, in the middle of the uh, vineyards because, you know, we have some indication of uh, what happens uh, in these uh, situations because, you know, people used to burn uh, everything in the uh, vineyards when they removed them, not so much anymore. I suppose if the ash layer or the burnt layer is let's say a couple millimeters thick and it may not even be that thick if it's just ash uh, it's probably a very small part of the soil that the plant is interacting with although what what happens when you get rain events and some of that uh, goes down into the soil or you till or whatever it is it goes into the soil again it's you know most cases it's probably small amount compared to the, the mass that's there under the vine, I would guess. Right? Yeah, I think the, the, the scale is so so greatly different that it'd be hard to hard to Oh, a, another question, uh, maybe a weird question. So is there any genetic variety in the response to fires by variety or potential genetic changes uh, that could be set off by exposure to heat and or fire damage? Interesting question. Potentially, I guess, is you could you could probably select for things that were more fire resilient by having more water in them, but I don't know of anything. And, and there's so few varieties grown anywhere anymore that, that, that you can't even make those observations. <laughs> yeah. So something I've just think, thought about, these are questions I sometimes get is about flame retardants. You know, when you have a lot of flame retardants being sprayed everywhere, and I've seen several instances where they try to miss the vineyards, mostly they do, and it's right on the edge of the vineyards, as the vineyard is usually not the problem. Um, but what will happen if you have flame retardants on a vine or on the soils, in the soils? Not good. <laughs> I know, aren't there a lot of them just like phosphates and things, so you're going to get a little bit of extra that in the soils? That's made well, to be I mean, broken uh, down. I mean, uh, those makes the uh, poison. It's very much like the uh, uh, no dust uh, that we spray in the uh, alleyways. If the uh, guy falls asleep, uh, you know, uh, playing on his phone, uh, driving these things around, like uh, they run into the vineyard, the uh, edges will uh, burn off. So again, uh, those makes the poison. Uh, so, but you know, these can be, uh, you know, uh, studied, uh, in, uh, you know, in small like uh, potted plants uh, as a dosage trial, and uh, we found out we just don't yeah. know. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that if they land on a vine, that's not a good idea. I, I don't no. know the impact on the soil. So far, it doesn't seem to have a major impact from the studies that I've looked at. But once again, the focus have never been specifically vineyards or vines. So is, 
uh, I, I know we're coming to the end of our time, but um, is there, if, and I'm hoping that we never have this kind of issue with fires and vineyards again, but given the, uh, the existing climate situation, I'm guessing it's going to happen. Is there anything, if there is a fire near your vineyard, is there anything that you can do to prepare your vineyard to um, keep, it, keep it healthier? Irrigate. <laughs> so it depends on if you have enough water where you can get it and it, more water is better in those situations, both for your, your own property and your own home and, and the vineyard for that matter. Yeah. Okay. It's a bit like this year. So last year was incredibly dry. If we, if you haven't, if you're growing a vineyard right now and you haven't irrigated yet, that's probably not a good thing. I would get some water on those vines. The roots are active all winter. What about having a pump that is not uh, dependent on electricity? <laughs> Windmills, yeah. You can yeah, do. sure. No, I'm just thinking about, in many instances, the power is cut as well in those areas. You know, um, so if you have solar, okay, that's not going to work all that well when there is no sun, but you may have some charged in a battery or something like that. <laughs> um, well, uh, we rendered our program through a sweep from a Department of our Water Resources. Uh, uh, there was a cost sharing out with the growers to update their uh, systems to be a more, we call it a, a being more climate resilient or a climate smart. So some of these uh, programs uh, were existent in the state before the uh, pandemic hit, but the uh, money for these uh, programs uh, ran out and uh, it was not uh, renewed uh, in this uh, new fiscal year. And I don't think it will be a renewed uh, up until uh, you know, this thing is uh, replaced. But uh, you know, irrigation pumps uh, you know, require a lot of uh, energy because you know, one, North Coast, uh, they might not be uh, running uh, as much, uh, but uh, you know, uh, other regions, you know, uh, an irrigation cycle might be uh, 25, 26 hours a week, sometimes uh, 40 hours a week. So uh, it's uh, very uh, energy dependent on uh, how this is a uh, mood. So I think we've actually come to the end of our time. I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, Andy and Khan for being our guests this week on Office Hours with David and Ida. It's um, certainly never easy being uh, the person sitting there having to answer all questions. It makes it even more difficult when there's very little knowledge of uh, around the things that your questions you're trying to answer. So I do appreciate both of you joining us and being in the hot seat for today. Um, this is the, the last of our Office Hours with David and Ida for this year. Uh, we've had 14 of them, as uh, Anita mentioned, that's in addition to four virtual on the roads this year. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Karen Block for organizing uh, a lot of these events, especially earlier on and through now. Um, and I'd like to thank Caroline Furman, who joined us in July, for terrific help in organizing these events. They don't just happen we kind of just show up and do our thing, but it takes a huge amount of organization ahead of time. And that's what Karen and Caroline do for us. They, they really make these events happen. So thank you very much to them. Um, none of these events happen without uh, a lot of uh, partnership um, funds that help pay for uh, our staff members and so forth that, that put these programs on. And so I'd like to thank all of our partners uh, in our Extension Industry Relations Partnership Program. We have 14 of them um, that contribute uh, quite a bit of money each year to make sure that we can put these events on for the industry and get you the critical information that you need. So when you see those partners, please thank them. If you're interested in being a partner in our program, please uh, contact me or Karen or Anita or Khan, any of us, Caroline, uh, and let us know and we can get you more information on how you can become a partner for Extension Industry Relations. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention and being part of the audience for this program and your great questions. I know this 2020 has been a very, very difficult year between COVID and the fires and all those things that affected you and your businesses, and again, you personally. Um, so all of us are hoping that 2021 is a, a much less eventful and much happier year. Um, I'd like to wish all of you and your families a happy and healthy new year coming up. And from Department of Viticulture and Knowledge, 
Uh, we hope you get some uh, rest time and have a very, like I said, happy holiday with your families. Um, so with that, uh, I think that brings the, the program to a close. Thank you again.